So this morning, uh, we're going to begin by looking at uh, another passage from Galatians. And to get us started, uh, uh, David Cook is actually going to play a different role. He's going to read the Bible, he's going to pray, and he's going to be interviewing me. Well, good morning, Keiho. Aussies don't say good, is it? They say great. No, no. We are we we. I like <laughs> that. Uh, uh, so, how are you today? Are you well? Um, my name is Keiho, uh, husband of uh, one wife, uh, Tree Tree, uh, and a father of uh, one child, Benjamin, 15 years old, um, born in Malaysia, uh, did most of my studies in Sydney, Australia, uh, previously worked as an engineer for about 11 years, uh, but now... What sort of an engineer were you? I was trained as an electrical engineer, but I gave 95% back to my lecturer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I did mainly project management. Yeah. And then I uh, went to study at Sydney Mission and Bible College uh, for three years. And then since then have been serving with the Presbyterian Church and more recently uh, full-time with KVBC Trust. Right, so tell us about your full-time role with KVBC. What are, the main, what are your main uh, duties there? So KVBC is more, uh, probably better known for the conferences that we organise, like the Three Nights Conference uh, that's held here. But uh, what we have uh, begun to do more intentionally is training, uh, especially training young people through a next-gen conference. And uh, more specifically for me, a uh, bulk of my time actually is spent preparing and uh, promoting uh, preaching workshops and the preaching course, uh, which uh, we're about to launch this September. So this is a very big conference we're having now because it's special because we are launching the CEP. Tell us what the CEP looks like or is going to look like. Well, the, I'm going to do something better. I'm going to show you if you uh, on your chairs or you probably would have picked up a copy of the CEP course. CEP stands for Centre for Expository Preaching. Uh, basically, we are trying to promote godliness through expository preaching. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, our, our aim is to come alongside those who are already doing that or those who are trying to develop to be equipped how to do that faithfully, come alongside you in a, uh, a more intentional way. Um, over 10 weeks, one day a week, or one day and one night a week, um, and uh, doing that over four modules or four terms, 10 weeks each term, to go through the basics of expository preaching how to do that in different genres, Old Testament genres, New Testament genres, and also how to integrate uh, systematic and what's called biblical theology uh, with our preaching. So the first module starts in September. That's the first intake of students, men and women? Men and women, we, are, we welcome all who are involved in training uh, in word ministry. So that first module will be the first of four. That will go for 10 weeks but it won't go for a full week for 10 weeks, will it? Yeah, it's, um, on, on that uh, prospectus, you will see our typical weekly calendar, which is Thursday night, we start with a meal, because we believe that uh, fellowship and community is important. Uh, we start with a meal, then lecture, and then we finish at about 10 o'clock on Thursday night. And then Friday, we begin at 8, again with breakfast. Food is important. And then we finish all the way at 4 o'clock. Right, and uh, so therefore... You'll do that 10 times, one day and one night of lectures. Yes, uh, not just lectures. Uh, there are three key components in the CP course, something that we learned from Proc Trust in the US and Semen Trust in the U uh, sorry, Proc Trust in the UK and Semen Trust in the US. Um, first component is lecture. We do need instructions, but we also learn through modeling. So throughout the course and actually all our workshops, expository preaching, expository preaching is being modeled. And then, thirdly, and uh, probably at the heart, which is the engine of the course, is small group work. So students, uh, participants will be working through one book of the Bible, each module, um, working through that book, how to actually work out what is the flow of the passage, the big idea of the mm -hmm. passage, application that is faithful uh, to the tune, mm -hmm. to, to, the, to, to the, what's called the melodic line, the message of that particular yeah. book. Yeah, so small groups whereby we will compare notes, we will critique one another, and we will uh, share sermon outlines or even uh, short sermons from the passages they're working on. That's right. really at the heart of the, of the course. It sounds very exciting. So the first module starts September. When does the second module start? Second, it's March, and then September, and then September, March. March. Yeah. And I could join at any module I like. So where, where I join is up to me. Uh, 
Technically, yes, but the first module, which is the foundation of expository preaching, uh, grounds you with basic principles plus also overview of the Bible. That is actually the prerequisite to all the other modules. Right. Once you have done the foundation, then you can do it in any particular order. And is the idea then that at the end of that four modules, I go off to college, or is it mainly designed for people who've been to a college and then they come and do this? Um, you can actually do both. Although ideally, I think uh, it is most ideal for people who are preparing to do further training. You can start with this because you can do it in your current capacities. And then as you develop a framework on how, what you are actually training for, then I think your theological, your three or four year theological education, you will maximize the value mm. of such a training. However, we also have a number of uh, friends who have done their three or four years of course, and they realize that uh, when you go to a seminary, you learn that how little time you have actually to engage and to think through how to apply those things in ministry. Mm. So it could also be a follow-up mm. uh, to the seminary training so that churches uh, with uh, fresh graduates that mm. they receive in the church, we, we suggest that it's a good way to actually help them to orientate to actual ministry mm. situation by continuing this one day a week. Um, as uh, to help them to yeah. develop their preaching. And does the government pay? They do in Australia, I just wondered. Oh, God pays for this, no. Uh, so no, uh, actually we are hoping, actually churches and organisations will pay for it, to actually include it in your pastors or your staff development fund. So there is it a is not, Yeah, it is 1,000 per module. So even if they do two modules per year, which is max, it's only 2,000 a year, which uh, I think fits very, it's, it's just a fraction yeah. of an annual budget. And tell us, where is the school? Where, where do we go? It will be held at the CP Centre, which is located in SS2, just on top of Evangel Book Centre. And you do some lectures, but you have other people doing lectures as yes, well. Yes, we, we uh, as with KVBC Bible Conferences, we believe that uh, we need to be exposed to different voices of our faithful expository preaching, so we, have, uh, we are organising the course on that basis as well. Yeah, terrific. Well, now, if I want to know more about this, where do I go today? Uh, you can come and talk to me, either here or right at the pillar there, uh, right next to where the food is being served. Right, so right at the pillar, right next to where the food is, please have a talk, because there may be people here who have got an idea of someone in their church who would be terrific. Yep. to send along for this because you could be working at the church for most of the week and just have that Thursday night, Friday off to do this. That's and it'd be a wonderful way of extending your ability. Mm -hmm. But also if you're a seasoned preacher as well, there's always new things to learn. Mm. Eh? Thank you. Dude. Good on you. That's good. Right. Thank Thanks, you. Keho. Oh, I, I hear you like cricket, they tell me. Oh. This is very good. It's a sign of a good man who likes cricket. <laughs> A little rat somewhere must have told you that. Well, you told me the score that the, the English, the dreaded Poms, beat the Pakistanis today. Mm. I'm all for the Pakistanis. Mm. All for anybody playing England. Yeah, I, I wonder why, David. I wonder why. <laughs> anyway, you, you do like cricket. Yeah, I That's enjoy That's very good. There you go. I want to learn preaching from a man who likes cricket. If you have uh, read church history, chances are you would have come across the name Marcion. It's spelled M-A-R-C-I-O-N. Marcion was the son of a bishop. He was a wealthy ship owner. He was a generous donor to the church. He was a respectable member of the Christian community, who later also proved to be an expert church planter. Put all that together very impressive man. But Marcion's claim to fame, what he's remembered for in church history, was for something else. He came under the influence of a Gnostic teacher, and he began to openly insist the God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament, they cannot be the same God. He was convinced that the gospel of grace has been corrupted by Jewish influences so that even the writings of the apostles have been compromised, except for the Apostle Paul. And so, he ripped out the entire Old Testament from the Bible. He took all the Gospels away except for Luke's Gospel, which is associated with Paul. He only kept 10 of Paul's letters as his Bible. Apparently, he even used Galatians 1 that we heard yesterday to justify 
He is purifying the church because there is no other gospel. Of course, the church cannot tolerate such a blatant rejection of God's word. And so he was excommunicated from the, from the church in AD 144, although he remained unrepentant, which is where he gone about planting churches all over the empire that rivals the church for many years. And, it continue, and that continued to cause problems for the church for centuries. Now, brothers and sisters, I think that you know that over the years, the church continued to be plagued by many such heresies like Marcion. But this morning, I want to draw your attention to another kind of threat to the church that is just as dangerous, if not more, than what Marcion stood for. And that is wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Leaders and teachers who seem so respectable and encouraging, and yet are in fact subtly corrupting the gospel from within the hierarchy, from within the institution, the kind of crisis Galatians were facing. As you know, the teachers and the leaders that came after Paul, they didn't come and say, throw away your Bible or rip off the Old Testament. On the contrary, they seem so well-versed so serious about the Old Testament, so concerned that the church actually get the full blessing that is promised in the Old Testament. And they also had impressive credentials. Is the Apostle Paul going to expose them for who they truly are? Well, how do you spot a, a, a fake Rolex watch? By comparing it closely with a real one. You can't study all the fake versions, but if you know the real one well, you will be able to spot a fake Rolex. These newcomers, they were imposing circumcision as a demand, as a specific requirement of the law uh, to Christians. And their basis, their authority was the Old Testament. So Paul took the Galatians back to the Old Testament. And he showed them especially what God actually promised Abraham, how it relates to the law that came later, and how both promise to Abraham and law of Moses actually finds fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Paul begins by highlighting that according to the Old Testament, the, promise that is blessed, the, the blessings that are promised to Abraham are to be received by faith, not by doing works of the law. Uh, look at verse 6, chapter 3. Paul quotes Genesis 15. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Jews took pride in their identity as Abraham's descendants, the one man out of all nations that God chose to bless. An identity that is especially marked by their obedience to the law, especially the mark of circumcision, which went before the law, which was uh, a sign given to Abraham of an everlasting covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants. So the Galatians were taught, if you want to receive all the blessings, you too must be circumcised. But Paul says, look carefully. No, don't do it. You can't do it. Why? Because if you look closely, the Old Testament actually says, how did Abraham got credited with righteousness? He believes God. He believed God. In verses 7 to 9, he goes on to stress faith four times. Understand then, he says, those who have faith are children of Abraham. Verse 8, scripture foresaw that God would justify not just Abraham, but all Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. Verse 9, it is those who are of faith that are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So just as Abraham was declared righteous by faith, so also all who are righteous by faith, therefore, are the true sons and daughters of Abraham. If you were here last night, you will be heard uh, Dr. Carson talk about sonship. In the same way, those who are of faith are like Abraham, because like 
father like son. If that's the case, what about circumcision and the works, the other works of the law then? Well, Paul goes on to point out, actually, again, if you read the Old Testament carefully, what it actually says is that instead of bringing life and righteousness, it actually warns God's people who rely on the works of the law that all who does so are under a curse. Paul explains this by referring to three key passages. Firstly, in verse 10, he refers to Moses' warning back in Deuteronomy 27. Moses already warned you, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything, everything written in the book of the law. If you fail to do everything all the time, you are under a curse. And then in verse 11, he refers to a much later passage, this time from the minor prophets, Habakkuk chapter 2, the righteous will live by faith. It's interesting that he quoted Habakkuk because Habakkuk serves towards the end. He, he was a prophet towards the end of Israel's existence, as you know, right before the exile, just before they were kicked out of the promised land by the Babylonians. And his message to God's people was mainly twofold. Firstly, as a nation, Israel, that is supposed to live by the law, Israel has failed miserably. That's why the warning from Deuteronomy that he just quoted will be fulfilled. They are indeed under a curse. And therefore, on that, for that reason, out of God's covenant faithfulness, the nation will be destroyed. They will be kicked out. And yet, even though they are a nation under curse, there is still hope. There is still hope. Because God, by His grace, has not quite given up on Israel yet. Because after judgment, Habakkuk assures God's people, God will yet again restore a portion of His people, the remnant, so that they are urged to trust, keep trusting in God's promise, continue to live faithfully as God's people, even through the time of judgment, because the righteous will live by faith. And then finally, Paul quotes verse, uh, uh, from Leviticus 18, the person who does these things will live by them. Now at first glance, the verse appears to suggest that promised life that uh, 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 appears to suggest that life is promised to those who obey the law, as if it's saying that there is a way. But in essence, especially when you have read the sequence of Old Testament verses, you realize that that is actually a condemnation. The law, works of the law, condemns Israel to perpetual slavery under the law. There is no way out. Because when nobody could fully obey the law, all of the law, all of the time, there's only one implication. They will be held perpetually under the curse of the law. And so Paul says, when you actually take a good look at the Old Testament in its entirety, the message is very consistent. You cannot rely on the law to secure righteousness before God. There is no way. It is a dead end. Instead, verse 13, Paul shows that God's plan is clear all along. There is only one way out for those who are under the curse of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That's the only way out. Jesus died on the cross to become the curse bearer, literally, so that the blessing promised to Abraham can come to all people who are cursed, but who are redeemed through Jesus Christ. They can receive the promise, the promise of the Spirit, by faith. By faith. That is the gospel. 
that is already announced in advance to Abraham. A gospel that applies to all nations, all who rely on faith, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. It's interesting, isn't it, friends? When the gospel is rightly understood, no matter where, which part of the Bible you look, it is both humbling and life-giving. Humbling because the gospel of grace, again, as we were reminded of last night, the gospel of grace requires us to, first of all, take, take, take sin seriously. To humbly confess that any attempt to please God by doing, any attempt to do that, is a dead end. There is no hope. And then, to those who are without hope, the gospel offers us this hope. When Jesus came, he came knowing the total depravity of our hearts. We tend to pretend that we are so impressive to try to please God. He knows what's going on in our hearts. And yet he came willingly. He remained on the cross even when he was despised by Jews and pagans. Even when he was deserted by all the people, all his own disciples even when his own people refused to accept him as the Christ and fell away from him. While we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. He died for us so that all who put our trust in him can be clothed with his righteousness once and for all and so receive the promised spirit of life. To have this assurance that in Christ, God will look upon us in the same way. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. He will always look at us in that way. We will never be more acceptable to God than we are today, if we are in Christ. And to believe that Christ has secured all that for us. That is the gospel faith. That is what faith is about. If God's plan all along, therefore, if that is what the Bible actually says, what the Old Testament actually says, all along blessings was meant to come through faith, that raises the obvious question. Why then the law? Why was the law given? Paul answers this question in two parts. Firstly, in verse 15, or rather we pick up in verse 17. Paul says, what I mean is this. Remember, the law introduced 430 years later, the law does not set aside the covenant previously established by God, God's covenant with Abraham, and thus do away with the promise. Because if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God, in His grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. I received this email from my bank, which I'm sure many of you also have received similar emails. A brand new iPhone 6 Plus is yours, followed by two pages of terms and conditions, or fine prints. Have you come across these advertisements? Paul says, is God like that? He gave Abraham a wonderful promise. And then 430 years later, oh, here comes the fine print. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Do you honestly think God is like that? He says, no, of course not. The law does not do away with the promise. The inheritance does not depend on the law. The promise is fulfilled by God, and as we know, as we look back now, through His seed, Jesus Christ. It was always going to be like that. Do not make God out to be a liar. Which brings Paul to his next point. Well, if 
the law therefore adds nothing to the promise, then why then? Why bother with the law? Why don't just stick with the promise? Answer is in verse 19. Paul says, yes, the law was added. Why? Because of transgressions. Now what does Paul mean, because of transgressions? Well, let me, this is what I think, let me explain with an illustration. Whenever my family, we go out with my parents, my mum and dad, our son Ben will always have to ask my father, who always like to sit on the front seat, Akong, that's why it's called him, we are Hokkien's, Akong, please put on your seat belt. Because Akong will never want to put on his seat belt. I think he's not alone, yeah? many Malaysians, we don't like to put on seat belts. Of course, we all know what seat belts are for. Yeah, they are meant to keep us safe. We have all seen all kinds of studies that shows that why seat belts is actually better even than airbags. Yeah? Seat belts cost money to install in every car, front and back. It costs money. And all the car sellers have already passed on the cost to install these seat belts to us when we buy the car. So we have paid money to have seat belts installed in our cars. So we know it's for our safety. We have paid for them as standard equipment for in our cars, front and back. So why do we still need laws to enforce seat belts in cars? Why do we need laws to force us to put on seat belts that we have paid for, that we know is for our own good? Because we are idiots. <laughs> because we are all idiots. Because we are by nature reckless. Even though most of the time we know what is good for us. We know what is good for us. But we just won't do them. And Paul says that's why the law was added. In verse 24 he says, The law has a role of a guardian. Guardian means not permanent custody, just temporary because guardians are not natural, actual parents. They have an expiry date. Paul uses this term to show that the law was our guardian, has a temporary role until, until Christ came, until faith is revealed, so that we might be justified by faith. Enforce, does having laws that enforce seatbelt actually make us one to wear seatbelts? Of course not. Of course not. Yeah. What happens when the law came in? It means we are not only idiots, but we are idiots who break the law. <laughs> That's what it makes us. Law breakers, transgressors, punishable when caught. When we see policemen, we put on. That's all the difference that it makes. When God introduced the law, it's not so that we can become righteous, but rather it convicts us. It exposes us for who we truly are, transgressors. And to convince us that however great a religion, even the Judaism, which is based on laws that has given through God's angels, anything that is based on our performance leads to a dead end. It is a dead end. It doesn't work. Because what we need is change that comes from within. What we need is what the Old Testament calls circumcision of the heart. Notice again, it's already referred to in the Old Testament circumcision of the heart, a heart that truly delights, desires to wear seatbelts. No, not seatbelts. To please God. To delight in God's law. To glorify God in all that we do. Until that happens, the law keeps everything locked up in sin. So that, verse 22, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone, might be given to those who believe. It is only by believing and by having the Spirit of Jesus in our hearts, only then 
we can ever be truly set free from our slavery to sin. Do you see? Which is why Paul highlights for the Galatians, it is therefore so foolish, so foolish for Galatians to be misled by this new brand of teachers. That now they are already Christians, to allow them, to compel them, to force them, to persuade them to be circumcised, to come under the law all over again, to watch what they eat, to observe special days, to do all those things. Paul says, before your very eyes, don't you remember the gospel that was preached before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. The guardianship of the law, that is over. Because you have already now received the whole package that is promised. Don't deny the work of Jesus Christ. Don't allow yourself to go under the curse of the law all over again. Don't you see? Friends, it's so important, isn't it? That we actually look so carefully at what the Old Testament actually says. Can I ask us to take a moment to reflect? How are we reading the Old Testament today? How are we teaching the Old Testament today to Sunday school children, to our young people, to each other? Are Old Testament stories always stories with the moral of the story is? Is that how we are treating the Old Testament? What they are supposed to do? A manual of do's and don'ts. In the same way as Paul warned the Galatians, we need to take heed of this warning. That is a path that leads to death. The letter that kills. Because the word without Christ, we give Old Testament without drawing them to Christ, assuring them of who we are in Christ, teaching the word of God in that way, kills. It doesn't give life. And yet, sadly, all we have to do is to go to a regular bookstore, even Christian bookstores, and we can find that many books, training materials, Sunday school curriculum, are still teaching God's Word in that manner. The Apostle Paul reminds us, warns us, exhorts us, read the Bible, teach the Word with understanding. Understanding how everything fits in the bigger picture of God's plan. Read everything in the light of Jesus. Because without Christ, remember what Paul said, the Bible remains veiled. It remains veiled. Its true message is hidden. Even though we are reading the word of God itself. It is not enough to just teach the word. We have to teach the word in all its fullness. Only Jesus enables us to understand God's word in all its truth. But when God's word is being handled and taught that way, our people will realize it is not burdensome. It is word of God's grace. It is life-giving. Even when it teaches us, rebukes us, when it corrects us, and trains us in righteousness, we realize it is making us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. In verse 26, Paul spells out for the church the wonderful assurance and the necessary implication of the gospel. Therefore, don't look to the law. In Christ, you are all children of God through faith. Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, everyone, we are all in all one in Christ Jesus. The coming of Jesus, the coming of faith, has closed the chapter of the guardianship of the law. It has opened the new chapter 
full blessings to all God's people through faith in the seed of Abraham, the curse bearer, Jesus Christ. There is no difference. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And it is, of course, still true for us today, which is wonderfully represented here in this room. Whatever our ethnic background, whatever our social background, whether we are charismatically inclined or reformed inclined, may I say, whether we support Pakatan or Barisan National, we are all one in Christ, all a new creation, created to do good works, to glorify Jesus, our Saviour, in Him. My friends, there is also a word of caution. The promise is for all who are in Christ through faith. Nothing more, but nothing less. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 does not mean anything goes. When we celebrate unity, when we offer assurance, it is only possible through faith in this gospel that is being preached, that is being proclaimed, that has been once and for all entrusted to God's people. There is no better gospel. There is no other gospel. That is why Paul wrote so urgently to the Galatians in the first place. Not anything goes. Start with the gospel of grace. Continue with the same gospel of grace. Add anything to it, it becomes nothing. So let us always read and teach the word of God in a faithful manner through the lens of Christ. God's grace alone, in Christ alone, by faith alone. A few years ago, my denominational leaders commissioned a group of us to start a school leaver program for Form 5 and Form 6 leavers to teach uh, originally denominational distinctives. I'm very glad that some of our graduates are here uh, this morning. But as a few of us came together and discussed what should we include in the curriculum, and as we met the students, we quickly realized, we quickly learned that what our young people need, our school leavers, what they need from us, first and foremost, is not denominational distinctives. What they need is a clear proclamation, teaching and grounding in the gospel of grace. Why? Because even though many of them have grown up in the church all their life, but over the years, what they have been filled with, what they have been fed in our churches are just layers upon layers of veils, of laws, of expectations, of duties, of what it means to be a good Christian, obligations, layers and layers upon veils that has caused them to lose sight of what it truly means to be a child of God's grace. And we realize that there's only one way that that multi-layered veil can be removed. It is when Christ is preached. Dear friends, how about your church? How about what you're doing right now in your own church programs, in your pulpit ministry? You know, Marcin like cult groups that love to twist the Bible, to say whatever they want, continue to be a threat to the churches, to our churches, and they can indeed cause great harm. They are very misleading. But I believe there is even greater danger in our churches today. When the Bible is very subtly, but clearly mishandled within our own church. When we invite to our pulpits, when we have our youth fellowships, our Sunday schools, teaching that on the one hand seems so serious to the Bible, memorize the Bible. Make sure you get it right. So serious. Do your quiet time. Do all these things, your spiritual disciplines. So spiritual. So orthodox. And yet in truth, we are teaching works. 
We're imposing expectations of the law instead of the gospel of God's grace. I think that's the greatest poison in our church today. May God help us to reflect, to repent, and to remind it again what it means to be faithful ministers of His word of grace, not ministers of the letter that kills. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promise of the gospel that was announced in advance to your servant Abraham that all who believe in you, we are righteous by faith because we are persuaded that you, Lord Jesus, are able to and have indeed done everything that is necessary to secure peace with God for us on our behalf. That through you, O Lord, we have received every spiritual blessing the blessing of the spirit of life, forgiveness, assurance, favour, so that whenever the Heavenly Father looks upon us, He sees the Son whom He loves, with whom He is well pleased. O oh Lord, forgive us for times when we have not remembered Jesus, when our eyes have shifted away from Him, when we become more preoccupied with what we have accomplished or what we could do instead of relying on what He has done. Oh Lord, help us to not stray from the path of grace. But as we have begun by grace, you remind us that you who began a good work in us, it is you that will bring to completion what you have accomplished. Help us to rely on your grace. Help us to be faithful messengers, ministers of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.